The sanctity of human life is under assault. Find out how and what you can do about it in this edition of Life Matters with Brian Johnston, Western Regional Director of the National Right to Life Committee. Brian Johnston is the Western Director of the National Right to Life Committee. He has served in many capacities while advocating for innocent lives. As California Commissioner on Aging, as Chairman of the California Pro-Life Council, on the board of the National Legal Center for the Medically Dependent and Disabled. And now here's our host, Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters, where your program on what the right to life really is and what this battle of ideas is really all about. Hey, where were you when the Dobbs decision came down? I was at the National Right to Life Convention. It was extraordinary, a great moment in American history, but a lot of people still don't understand the specifics. A lot of people don't understand what really happened in Roe v. Wade. And therefore, really understanding what happened in Dobbs, is it overturned Roe v. Wade? That is an incredibly important aspect. If you think you already know what Roe is, but you haven't grasped it, you're going to have a hard time understanding the battle that our nation is now in, in this battle of ideas. We're going to cover a lot of stuff today. We're going to go over some of the stuff from the National Right to Life Convention By the way, you can go to nrlcconvention.com. You can find out all of the many workshops because once you understand what the right to life is, you're going to understand there is a lot here. It impacts our whole society. And today we're going to cover the waterfront. I'm going to talk about Jack Nicholson, among other things. But I'm also going to talk about adoption. I'm going to talk about religion. You're going to get some exposure to that. That's just a sampling of what you have to understand. Some people have gotten back to me and they really appreciated a recent program I did on the two Justice Jacksons. Yes, that's right. There are two Justice Jacksons in recent American history. One is Robert H. Jackson of the Supreme Court. Another is the brand new Supreme Court Justice, Ketanji Jackson. And in that program... It is episode 282. If you want to find out what's really at stake, I talk about the right to life and self-evident truths and the laws of nature and nature's God. If you don't understand that that's the predicate for America's legal system, if you don't understand that that is the predicate for the right to life, you're going to get lost. So here on our program, we talk about the right to life. We talk about what it means. And... In our culture, it's somehow just reduced to choice. Well, that's intellectually dishonest. Choice requires an object. What is it that's being chosen? They will not examine that in pop culture. The media does not examine that. But you know what? Jack Nicholson does. (laughs) That's right. I'm going to talk about adoption in a minute. And Jack Nicholson was actually adopted, but in a very different way. We're going to talk about the different types of adoption. Jack Nicholson was actually 37 years old when he found out about his adoption, but it was different. There are so many types of adoptions. By the way, if you're talking about choice, there are so many other choices that can be made than ripping up a baby and throwing that baby in the trash. There are so many other very, very life-affirming choices that the media does not talk about. Choice has come to equal abortion. Well, Jack Nicholson is not pro-abortion, and he knows that in the Hollywood community that's not popular. He doesn't care. Because Jack Nicholson was 37 years old when he found out from a Time magazine reporter that he was actually adopted. He didn't know that. That reporter had dug into his life and found out that the woman that he thought was his mother was actually his grandmother. The woman he thought was his sister was actually his mother. He grew up at home. He left home. He was 37 years old. He never knew that, but he is so thankful. You can look this up. Look up Jack Nicholson. He is so thankful that he was given life. He loves his mother and grandmother for making a wise decision. That's just one form of adoption. There are dozens of different forms. We're going to hear in a little bit from an adoption agency, an organization that was at the National Right to Life Convention. I've sat down with Lori Standard from Abiding Love Adoptions in Georgia, and they serve the South. But there are adoption agencies across this nation. You need to know there's so many different types of adoption that giving life to another 
is so important. It's really the fulfillment of pregnancy. <laughs> you know, my mom terminated a pregnancy. I don't talk about it a lot, but she did. And I was born because pregnancy is a condition. I was in her womb. And when I was born, that terminated the pregnancy. Our opponents do not want terminating a pregnancy. They want a dead baby. Don't let the deceitful language of the media and the pop culture and the pro-abortion mentality, don't let it stand. Don't put up with that. Jack Nicholson doesn't. He pays the price. He doesn't care. He is pro-life and he says, I have to be. <laughs> I have to be. I wouldn't be here otherwise. It's a great story. Now we're going to hear just now from Lori Standard. She's going to talk about a particular type of open adoption that they use at their agency. But you need to know there's many types of adoption. Again, Jack's situation is just one. But most often there are agencies involved, and sometimes there are closed adoptions. And that's when the, the mother doesn't want to meet the couple. And they don't ever meet. It's all done by intermediaries. Usually attorneys are involved. But that's called a closed adoption. Then there's a partially open adoption. And then there's a completely open adoption. That's when, when the child grows up knowing that the birth mom is there, knowing that they're adopted all along, and that birth mom is actively involved in their life. And there's different degrees of that. So you're going to hear when we come back from Lori Standard from Abiding Love Adoption Agency. Remember, this is just one of dozens and dozens and dozens of answers. We're just talking about adoption right now. Keeping the baby is another one. But the fact is, is that if you're going to talk about choice, can we please talk about what it is being chosen? We'll be right back after this. You're listening to Life Matters. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. I support this show, and I would like to offer you our biggest discounts for listening. So please go to our website, MyPillow.com, and put in the promo code at the end of this message to get the biggest discounts. Again, thanks for listening, and God bless. I got a pair of my slippers from the MyPillow company. They're incredibly comfortable. I actually wear them out on errands. They're cool in the summer, as well as very warm in the winter. Any My Pillow product, you can get their highest discount when you use the promo code LIFE, L I F E. Very important. Go to My Pillow, any of their many products, use promo code LIFE, all caps, L I F E, LIFE. So go to My Pillow, put in the promo code LIFE, and you'll get some wonderful discounts because Mike Lindell believes in you and because life matters. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. All right, we're going to hear from Lori Standard. She is with Abiding Love Adoption Agency, just one of many different types of adoption agencies across our nation. Here's Lori Standard from the National Right to Life Convention. I bumped into her there. My name is Lori Standard. I'm with Abiding Love Adoption Agency. We are licensed in Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina currently. Um, our executive director is also a adoption attorney licensed in Georgia. Um, that way we can make sure that all, everything is legal when we, um, when one of our birth mothers decides to place, um, we see it through to the end. Um, we advocate for open adoption. We try to connect our adopted families that come to us through consultants um, who match with our birth mothers. We try to connect them early on so they develop a relationship so they can also, um, you know, get to know each other instead of just showing up on the day a baby's born and um, making a placement. Um, we advocate for women, especially, especially if they do not want to place, they change their mind and want to parent. We're okay with that. We will support them in any way they want. If they decide to place, we see them through to um, through revocation in all the states. We get them through post-placement. And then um, six weeks after post-placement, we move them into our uh, Abiding Love charity side, nice. which is um, supports women in education. We've just launched our new SEEN curriculum. It's S-E-E-N. Whereas we see women, we, we hear them, we see them. We want to advocate for them. So we've just launched our new SEEN curriculum. 
that um, is gone into the PRCs, the um, Pregnancy Resource Centers, and uh, we set that curriculum where they can start their own birth mother support groups and use the curriculum to help further educate and support those birth mothers. Well, that is excellent. And one of the things I think people generically as a culture were being told by the abortion industry and really by the culture at large, oh, don't, don't adopt. Don't adopt that baby out. That that baby is, that's your baby. That's terrible to give them up for adoption. And so there's a generic war against adoption. And it's important that people know that, no, it's this is a wonderful thing. And there's many, many adoptive people. I know many. And they're so glad that they were allowed to live. That's correct. And um, I think what, what we are trying to do as a society that are pro-adoption especially Abiding Love Adoption Agency, we're trying to get the word out there that open adoption can work, that there is a relationship formed between the birth mother and the adopted family where that child is given a chance to know everybody. Yes, there's going to be hurt. You can't say that when a a mother walks away from a hospital after placing her child that there will not be hurt. You cannot say that there's not going to be hurt when an adoptive family who cannot conceive child, you know, walks away because a mother decides to parent. Mm. Um, There's going to be hurt on both sides. Somebody's going to be hurt, but that's where God's grace comes in. And that's where we come in to help educate these families and, and show them how open adoption does work and can work and can heal both sides of that eventually because that child wins. And if the child wins, we all win because the child was not aborted. The birth mothers understand there is a choice. And that's why we're trying to get into the pregnancy resource centers to explain, here's your other options. Adoption is not scary. Um, It is, it could be one of the best things in the world, but it has to be done right. And we're trying to educate those pregnancy resource centers on how it is done right and how it is working. And here's our families that are working it. That's wonderful. And I think culturally people tend to think, well, that's just conserved Christians that are pushing that. But I look back and culturally as a nation, I think we are moving that direction. The film Juno, I think was very clever. It was cute, it was cute but really underscored exactly. that this is an issue of, of a human being yes. and life. And it really, I think, underscored that a woman does intuitively know, and the young girl who portrayed Juno, you know, that uh, that was cute, that said, well, who's the kid? <laughs> well, I don't know, but he's got fingernails, mm-hmm. which was a very cute response. Yes. But it, it's, it's intuitive. A mother knows that that's a child. Yeah. And to give that child life, Exactly. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. And as a mother of five children, I do not have any adopted children. I have three stepchildren, which I consider my bonus children. I did not give birth to them, but I would do anything in the world for them. And I can't imagine. I know it's a hard decision to place a child. I, I We've sat with women who have cried. We've cried with them. But they were so secure in their decision to give that child everything that they could not give that child at the time and at least stay a part of their life. And what we see as a part of their life is we make an agreement between the adoptive family and the birth mother where they send pictures so often. And that's controlled by the birth mother. She Mm. asks what she needs, you know, she wants them to do and they agree to it. Mm -hmm. Um, They do so many visits a year. If they're, you know, state to state and can't get there very often, then, you know, they travel. I mean, the adoptive family has to travel to her. That is part of the agreement. Um, Whatever she's wanting in her agreement is what we do. So it is so birth mother centric that we make sure she gets her wishes. Mom is always right. It's the same is true if it's a natural birth. Mom is always right. And that is where I'm the director of adopted families. So that's where I come in to make sure the adopted families are doing their job and that proper boundaries are being set up. And everybody is working towards the same goal, which is the child and the child that you want to give life to. So that is our bottom line. And that's what we want to do. Oh, that's wonderful. And as I said, you can find out more about the National Right to Life Convention. I bumped into Lori, spent some time with her at the National Right to Life Convention. That's when the Dobbs decision came down. If you go to nrlcconvention.com, 
You're going to hear about next year's convention in Pittsburgh. But most importantly, you're going to hear about all the very in-depth issues that emanate from the principle that we have a right to be alive. That that's a gift from our creators and that our government was established to ensure these rights. Governments are instituted among men. That's why we care about politics. The laws are established so that they will protect the innocent from being killed. That's the very first assertion. That's the very first right. By the way, make sure when you're talking about rights, don't let people get away with saying this is a right or that is a right. Many people confuse what a right is. And the fact is, is that's a very specific legal privilege. And we know that the essential rights we're given are given by our creator. That's a principle of the American founding, and a just government will ensure those rights that you've been given by your creator. That's the purpose of government, a just government. A just government does that. An unjust government violates those rights. But when someone says, I have a right, often they're talking about, no, an ability. I can do this. I can do that. A very quick example. I have the ability. I have a giant plumber's wrench. It's huge. And it's hard to pick up. It's heavy. It's a workout to pick it up. But with that giant wrench, I can go around and I can unscrew pipes that are huge. And if I then went out and started using that on the fire hydrants in my neighborhood, because I can, and I've decided I'm going to. Well, just because I have that ability, that's not a right. And thank God there are policemen, and first it'll be the firemen that show up first. And they're going to tell me, buddy, you don't have that right. That's not a right. But many people, again, confuse their ability to do something. And you do. You have many abilities in a free nation. But they're not necessarily rights. Make sure that when this notion of a right, I have a right to do this, I have a right to do that, Make sure that you examine what it is that's being asserted, just with choice. Again, when it's talked about that you have the right to choice, say, hey, well, let's get specific. Choosing what? Choosing hair color? Yeah, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Choosing clothing? Okay, yeah, you have, you have that ability to choose what clothing you want. Choosing to kill a human baby and throw it out? Well, wait a second, let's talk about that. That's a very specific thing. It involves another person, just as my taking off the fire hydrant <laughs> involves other people. So it's not a right. We have to talk about specifics in our movement. We're gonna talk about more of that when we come back. You're listening to Life Matters. They say sunlight is the best disinfectant. Did you know that California has a law in the books that says you need to protect babies born alive in the course of an abortion? But that law is simply ignored. The current legislature and Governor Newsom's administration support all abortions all the time. And they simply do not examine or regulate the practice even though our tax dollars pay for it. We need to shine a light on this cover-up of the abortion industry in our state. Go to CaliforniaProLife.org and click on the Light of Day Project. We need the facts about late-term abortion to be examined and made known. We need the government doing its job to protect lives. We need the Light of Day on this. Go to CaliforniaProLife.org. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. Next, we're going to talk about the role of religion in our movement. And our program is heard on Christian stations now across the nation. And I'm glad of that. We're also heard on conservative talk stations. And I'm glad of that, too. We need to talk about specifics. And we're going to talk about religion next. Because most people who are pro-life actually come from a specific faith background. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the National Pro-Life Religious Council because there is a commitment of religious folks to work together to restore the right to life. But let me get even more in depth, and this is important. There are some Christian faiths whose denomination officially has decided to be pro-choice. 
they haven't been intellectually or morally honest about the real implications, the full implications. They've decided to tap into religious relativism, a relativistic thinking. Again, earlier podcast, if you go back in our podcast, we've dedicated several podcasts to religious relativism within the pro-life movement. And so it's very common for religious people, they may think they're dealing with absolute truth, but the tendency is actually to get relativistic. And there are certain denominations, United Church of Christ, the Wesleyan denomination. There are certain denominations that actually have adopted a pro-abortion position and said, that's okay with our particular denomination. And you might be in one of those denominations. So in a minute, we're going to hear from some folks with concerned Wesleyans. And that's a denomination. I know a lot of Wesleyans. And the fact is, is that the Wesleyan denomination has taken a pro-choice position. But there's many Christians in that denomination that are saying, wait a second, that isn't a valid position for our church to take. And they're working for life within that religious organization. There's others. Let me just mention some that are part of the National Pro-Life Religious Council. You can you can Google that. That's that's an extension of the religious outreach programs at National Right to Life. But your denomination may be pro-life and actively asserting the right to life, but you need to know that there are relativistic people warring against that. And I'll say specifically in the Catholic Church, that's what we talked about in the relativism program about the Catholic supposed idea of the seamless garment, that there are many life issues, and so don't care about killing the innocent. There's so many related tangential issues. Let's talk about those. That is called relativism. And even when it's religious, it's relativism, and you need to recognize it. But again, if you're in a church that's already made that decision at the highest level of their Sanhedrin, of their bureaucracy, you can still fight for life, and there's organizations there. Anglicans for Life, look that up. Great folks, but they're dealing with the challenge within the Anglican church. As I said, you're going to hear from concerned Wesleyans and those of you who are involved in the Wesleyan denomination or related denominations. There's several denominations that emanated from Wesleyan. The United Church of Christ, many of you know our good friend. We've had him on, Father Frank Pavone. He works with Priest for Life, and he is dynamically asserting the actual proper and scriptural teachings of the Catholic Church when it comes to protecting innocent lives. So he's fighting that good fight. Presbyterians, pro-life, another great one. Lutherans for life. So these organizations are there. Go to the National Pro-Life Religious Council, and you can find out more. But right now, I'd like you to hear from the Concerned Wesleyans for Life. Well, I'm at the National Right to Life Convention right now with Alan Morris. And Alan Morris, tell us about what you're doing with Concerned Methodists. Okay, first of all, I'm a layman. I'm not a clergy, but I felt called by the Lord to contend for the faith in the United Methodist Church. Historically, it is the denomination itself, founded by John and Charles Wesley with Susanna Wesley's strong influence, uh, very centered on the Bible and on biblical values and fully on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But over the years, it has just really become very corrupted. It, it uh, tends to support a... Uh, plethora of left-wing political issues, and I am ashamed to say that uh, during the Roe versus Wade decision before the Supreme Court, uh, some of our staffers had testified as friends of the court to support abortion. Mm. Uh, historically, we have been the, uh, since that time, we have been the largest denomination that has been pro-abortion. Oh. And thankfully, a few years ago, that uh, other pro-life people and uh, we helped to get it overturned to where we're officially not pro-abortion anymore, but we still have uh, staffers at the general boards and agencies that are. And again, we feel called to contend for the faith in the United Methodist Church. We're a broadly based network of laity and clergy that is doing that. And we say, get out of supporting abortion, get out of left-wing political activism, and get back to the Bible as being God's Word and through uh, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Along with that, we have different media that we use to disseminate our information. We have authored 
uh, uh, different books. We also, the Christian Methodist newsletter goes uh, to over 17,000 people across the nation in all 50 states. And then uh, we are networked also very strongly with delegates around the world and especially in Africa. You know, they are very biblical yes. and they are rock solid in terms of standing for family values. Isn't that amazing? That's exactly right. Well, we're so glad that you are part of the pro-life team, and there are many, many denominations. There are pro-lifers fighting. Some denominations, sadly, have gone pro-abortion because of the ideology of our culture. And so it's up to Christians, whatever church you go to. But if you happen to be a Methodist, now you know where you can go, and you've got friends and allies. Thanks so much. Thank you again, and thank you for everything that you do. And uh, if I might add one other thing, sure. we, we always look forward to exhibiting at the uh, National Right to Life conventions all the way from Overland Park, Kansas, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, you know, at Herndon, Virginia, and of course now here in Atlanta, Georgia. But uh, as you can imagine, when we call out the hierarchy with their falsehoods, we get a lot of criticism. And of all the places that we exhibit, we love exhibiting here because it's like we're among family. And uh, I and uh, Brother Jeff here has six kids. He's, he loves kids, and I've been a volunteer for kids. And that one thing that really brings a lot of joy is seeing all the teenagers and all the kids That's here. That's right. Yeah, and I think if you're a Christian of any background, you, you love kids. That's that's God's gift. Right. Yes. May I say one final yes, word? Yes, by all means. And, of course, the, the uh, United Methodist Church is Protestant. Unfortunately, sadly, it's uh, politically liberal Protestant, and we are Protestants. But I, I'm retired Army, and I am so thankful for the allies that we have in the pro-life uh, movement, and yes. especially— uh, I've, and I've mentioned this before countless times, the stand of the Roman Catholic Church for life and for family values. And when Pope John Paul was alive, was it, 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 oh, he was, he was very strong. And at that time, we took out That's in, in uh, the directory a full-page ad uh, that just was really giving a shout-out to other evangelical Protestants, but especially to Pope John Paul and the witness of the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, he was excellent. He, he was, and again, I'm Army. We're in a, uh, really a very f crucial fight yes. in, uh, for the culture of our faith, and we need to come together as allies. And as I said, I know I'm repeating myself, but I thank the Lord for the strong witness of the Roman Catholic Church. That's right, that's right. Hey, they have internal struggles too, we've seen it, but the pro-life stand is what matters. So, wow, we're very proud of you. Thank you again for, for coming down. Life Matters is a production of the California Pro-Life Council, the state affiliate of National Right to Life.